Well, hello, Dr. C. Thank you so much for being here on my podcast, Test Those Breasts. I am incredibly honored to have you here. Um, I ran across you on another podcast called Rewritten Me, and I have listened to your episode actually a few times because I've been so fascinated by a particular app that you have created. And we're going to talk about that a little while in a little while. So, but you are a surgeon in Texas, Austin, uh, is it Austin, Texas? San Antonio. San Antonio. Thank you. I will edit that out. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But anyway, welcome. And thank you for being here. I appreciate it. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to get acquainted. Lovely to see you and hear you. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. So I have now followed you on Instagram um, on a couple of different pages, but I wanted to kind of put it out there to my audience. So I have been sharing that episode that you have been on, but I wanted to get more information out to my wide, my audience as well. And I am a breast cancer survivor. I became cancer free in December after my deep flap surgery I had in New Orleans. And I remember back after I finished my chemo back in October, I had some very quick decisions to make and it can be incredibly stressful and overwhelming, which is exactly what I went through. And I had to really sort of change directions when I found out about the deep flap, but I didn't find out through my surge. And I found out through three different friends of mine who reached out to me and told me about this type of surgery that I had no clue even existed. And so I canceled my surgery here where I live because I knew that if I had the mastectomy here, it would go into immediate reconstruction and implants. And that is not something I wanted to do. And Mm -hmm. I was very adamant about it. So I real quickly did my own research, talked to a lot of people and ended up going to New Orleans. So So how how did your local docs take that? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I try to be really careful because I have a lot of respect for my local surgeon and I, she is a wonderful surgeon and we just don't have that kind of surgery here in Reno. And I had asked her about it when I was in my appointment with her. And I, I said, I heard about this, this surgery where they use your own tissue. And she said she didn't really know much about it, but her biggest mm-hmm. concern was that there was no local care when I came back to Reno. Um, and that's all I actually spoke to her about. I didn't have, we didn't sit down and talk about my options and what was best for me, which I'm very much an advocate on about having mm, care or uh, providers really sit down and talk to patients and be part of those decisions on what's best for their bodies. And that Mm -hmm. did not happen. So my ultimate decision to go to new Orleans happened to be the best decision for me mentally, physically, emotionally, the whole nine yards. So I'm all about holistic healing and, um, incorporating holistic healing into the whole process. So, I canceled the surgery and I just haven't spoken to her since. Um, Anyway, that's my story. And I wish so much I would have run across you and your app earlier. And we will talk about that. But first, I really want to to kind of dig into um, having you share what led you to become a plastic surgeon and microsurgeon and how has that impacted your personal and professional life? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I, I, well, I wanted to be a physician, I think, when I was eight. So I came across an essay I wrote in English class. Um, and it was entitled, Why I Want to Be the Queen's Eye Surgeon. And so I, 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 I grew up in London, 
I have no idea why I wanted to be the queen surgeon and specifically an eye surgeon at that. But that's apparently what I thought I wanted to be when I was eight. Um, when I was 16, I knew or I felt very strongly that I wanted to become a plastic surgeon. But that wasn't because of all the Hollywood movies. That was because, you know, watching, you know, m my dad was a huge history buff. and. Um, he would watch whenever he could, he would watch um, history documentaries and um, connecting with him and bonding with him over history is what actually exposed me to the history and the origins of plastic surgery. Because he, in particular, he was very, very keen on learning about uh, the world wars. And so plastic surgery really came into its own during the world wars uh, because that's really when reconstruction kind of took off in terms of a necessity as a specialty and so <clears throat> seeing all these documentaries that would show wartime reconstructive surgery and the horrendous injuries that soldiers would have to deal with and recover from and the reconstructive procedures that were being performed to you know restore people's noses and faces and limbs and all these things i found that absolutely fascinating um and then the more i got into plastic surgery um the more i realized how broad a specialty it it, it is um <clears throat> and it involves microsurgery I mean, so much so that the first kidney transplant you know was actually performed partly by a, a plastic surgeon which no no one knows that but so plastic surgery was instrumental in tissue transplantation and the birth of that too. Um, and so, you know, I went to medical school only because you had to become a doctor first before becoming a plastic surgeon. So for me, medical school was a means to an end. Um, and then being exposed to plastic surgery that, you know, uh, initially actually, um, it was microsurgery, but more towards hand surgery. And then um, I stumbled across breast microsurgery out of uh, community need, really, uh, where, I, where I was working um, initially, um, much like your experience, you know, tissue transplants, you know, complex tissue reconstruction wasn't being offered to breast cancer patients. And so I started doing that and actually I, I fell in love with it and I far preferred it to hand surgery. Uh, and so then my breast reconstruction kind of practice took off. And um, and like like most people these days, unfortunately, you know, we have, we have breast cancer in our family, you know, um, my godmother passed away from breast cancer. So yeah, lots of reasons, really. I love the way, you know, as my practice and experience uh, matured, I, I love the way that breast reconstruction really includes absolutely everything about, you know, the plastic surgery specialty. Um, complex reconstructive techniques, microsurgery, uh, restoring form and function. That's what the word means, plastikos, it's from the Greek, you know. So it means to mold and restore. So that's what plastic surgery is. And then, of course, you add the aesthetics and, and the, the, the critical nature and, and, and uh contribution of the aesthetics and having a good aesthetic eye and the artistry of it and you've got a really incredible specialty um that's very powerful and i i just love i love being in a team that specializes in it and being surrounded by people that are so passionate about it we're very lucky um in my practice prma uh, in san antonio you know we have eight surgeons and we all have the same passions and we're very much focus on tissue transplantation techniques like the deep flap uh, for breast reconstruction and for high risk patients. Um, and really it's just grown um, 
from from those from from humble beginnings and now we see people from all over the country and even other parts of the world you know that travel for these complex very natural procedures and <clears throat> specialty just keeps getting better and better and you know we're restoring feeling we're preserving feeling you know we've we've moved on from just creating a breast mound to actually you know res- preserving sensation as much of it as possible restoring feeling uh, focusing on the aesthetics um and as much as possible leaving women looking like they've had a mummy makeover rather than a cancer operation you know so they can enjoy the rest of their lives and get back to their lives as much as possible you know so anyway long-winded answer but that's me in a nutshell (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I love your long-winded answer. By the way, my husband and I are history buffs ourselves. We both retired from being a social studies teacher. And cool. so uh, I love hearing the historical background. And I love the fact that you have had this desire uh, to go into this, or maybe not, not, you didn't think about breast surgery or anything like that, but just this desire from such a young age, which tells me a lot about you. You know, there's some people who go into, you know, the medical field for reasons that aren't necessarily personal or, uh, you know, maybe it's just for the money. I don't know. But there's a lot of work that goes into it. My nephew is doing his residency at Mayo Clinic right now in Minnesota, and it's a lot. So Mm -hmm. I know how much physicians, surgeons, I know how much you guys go through. So thank you for being in our community and doing what you do. And I loved your long winded answer. It wasn't, it was very fascinating. So what tell this tells me also, and I'm sorry to hear about your godmother. That is, it's very difficult, I'm sure. Uh, but that also has a connection to some personal, you know, Uh, experience. And I don't know how I would have known about these other kinds of surgeries, because when I think about reconstruction, all I ever thought of were implants. And I have been very vocal about letting people know that I do not have anything against implants. I think every woman should, and man, uh, should be able to do whatever they want with their body, what feels best for them. But we just didn't have the knowledge here in our town. I, I, when I came back from New Orleans, I was telling people what I did and people were like, I've never even heard of that. So my biggest mm-hmm. mission is to get it out there of the possibilities and options that women do have. Um, not all women can afford to do it, which I'm really happy about CMS's uh, decision about mm-hmm. the deep flap surgery that just came out recently that will make it more accessible to more women. <laughs> and so um, I'm just grateful that I know about this. And now I can let other people know about these surgeries. And then again, your app that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, breast surgery, as I said before, is our breast cancer itself is so incredibly overwhelming. I know that I went through some seriously deep, dark places in the last year and f- fear, so much fear, so much anger. And I will tell you straight up, I loved my breasts and a lot of women do. They would love their breasts. Like we're attached to them. We love the feeling. And so I was absolutely horrified when I found out that I had to have a mastectomy and what I was about to go, what road I was about to go down. And so one of the reasons I went to New Orleans is because I know that they deal with all things holistic, holistic healing. Mm -hmm. And so what are your philosophies on your philosophy on incorporating holistic approaches in your practice? I think it's crucial. You know, um, I think you have to do it. Um, and, And holistic means different things to different people. So that's the first question. First thing you have to explore is what's important to the person. Um, it, it's yet another aspect of care that you need to approach in a shared decision-making way. So 
you know, for, for, for some people, it's the incorporation of, you know, acupuncture. For others, it's certain aspects of diet. For others, it's a, certain aspects of their lifestyle that's going to help them with their mental health and their journey in terms of dealing with things emotionally. You know, it's very, it's not a single, you know, it's not a simple menu that everyone follows, right? So, um, you know, we don't have, you know, in our practice, I, I don't have like a holistic checklist that we give mm -hmm. patients or anything like that. But what comes out of getting to know the, the person and the patient, the family, their support structure, their needs, uh, their lifestyle choices, preferences, work, um, all of the above, um, that approach in and of itself is holistic and has to be. Uh, just because you're a candidate for a procedure doesn't mean it's the best procedure for you. Um, for some women, breast implants are the best option. It's just, to your point, it's unfortunate that some people, you know, that that's the only option they're given, right? So, um, but... But yeah, I mean, to answer your initial question about holistic approaches, uh, I'm very uh, open to listening to patients and what that means to them individually and what's important to them. Um, and uh, if it's um, certain nutritional things or, you know, beyond the nutritional components that we recommend for to optimize healing and, and all the rest of it. Um, if it's certain activities, if it's um, Eastern medicine, acupuncture, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, absolutely. You have to consider it. Um, it's an incomplete treatment plan, really, if you don't, for some patients more than others. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Right. Yeah, it is incomplete. I um, I've always been into holistic healing and I, and I definitely am aware that it's, it's not a one size fits all and there's no checklist. It's one of those things where you, you kind of, when you do get to know the person, you, that's where the menu comes from. It's like, you know what, you're having problems with this. You should try this and maybe mm -hmm. incorporate this into your um, into your uh, life as far as nutrition or meditation or yoga or things like that. I will say that after my breast surgery, I have definitely felt so much better about my decision. I did have to fork out 10 grand to do it just because I was out of network it, they mm -hmm. took my insurance, but it was out of network, but very well worth it to me. And luckily I have a cancer policy that I somehow had the wherewithal to get when I was in the school district. And so I was reimbursed for quite a bit of that. But I really do believe also that if other areas have this kind of, you know, the kind of surgery that I decided to go with, like if I had it here, if we had that option here in Reno, I do believe that my amazing surgeon here would probably have sat down with me and talked to me about those options. Um, I just, I really want somebody to come to our area so that people can, can uh, have that option without having to go out of the area. Um, I want to get into your awesome app. It is called Breast uh, Breast Advocacy App, or uh, Breast Advocate, Breast Advocate. App, and mm -hmm. it's free. And I will tell you that I have gone through all kinds of widgets and and <laughs> all of the all of the magical things that are on that app. What led you to developing that app? Well, it was really to fill a void that I was experiencing in my own practice. Um, you know, when you start off, um, in practice, you know, you, you, your focus is different. It's about, you know, um, offering the best service you can, the best outcomes, honing your skills. It's all very kind of a personal technical focus, right? 
Um, and then once you've been doing it for a while, other things kind of creep in because, you know, you're comfortable doing what you're doing. You've got the experience. You've proved, you've proved to yourself that, you know, you can do it. You, you don't really, you know, the ego is checked. You've got a few more gray hairs. You're more humble. Other things become a little bit more, you know, noticeable, important, whatever. It, your practice just changes. Your philosophy changes as you mature. Um, and so for me, it was, and especially as PRMA was evolving and was getting, you know, our footprint was widening, our net was widening, um, we're getting people from all over. And then it would just, it just hit me how I was hearing the same issues from patients who were traveling to see me, you know, irrespective of their geography that really echoes what you've been saying and what your, what your experience has been. Um, you know, ha if I had known then what I know now, then I wouldn't have done this or then I would have chosen something else or, you know, whatever, fill in the gaps. Right. But basically it was lack of information, it, it, lack of complete information, lack of, uh, a full discussion about all the options and lack of involvement in in the the treatment planning of, of their own treatment right you know i thought well i should look into this right i mean it's it's just it was it was infuriating how so many people weren't happy with their experience and some were some were disappointed others were upset and some were very mad it was a whole you know broad spectrum um, so I thought, well, there's got to be, there has to be something out there that can help us fill this gap. And I, and I you know, it's got to be an app for that, right? There's an app for everything. <laughs> and then I was, as I was re researching everything, number one, there wasn't an app. And then number two, I came across this concept, this approach called shared decision-making, which was actually first described uh, back in the 80s, right? So it's an, it's an old concept. It's been around for a while. And so, and so the more I read about shared decision-making, the more I realized how it was the antithesis of what I was brought up uh, with in terms of the doctor-patient approach and relationship. So, I, you know, when you get to my age, you know, when you look back on the training, that we had, it was more paternalistic, right? So patient comes in, doctor tells them what they think and what they should do, and the doctor and the patient says, Thank you very much, doc. Especially in the NHS, in the UK, <clears throat> you know, the doctor's always right. You know, I I, I grew up in the in the National Health Service. So I came through the system in the UK and you never had uh I mean it was the epitome of apprenticeship. I mean that's what medical training tends to be anyway, wherever you are. But you know, we would sit there on you know in the corner of the room, listening to the consultation between the consultant, the specialist, and the patient. And it was very much, you know, whatever you say, doc, that was the philosophy, mm -hmm. that was the mentality. Especially the older population, um, very, very respectful of the physician, but there, there was no two-way conversation. The only exchange was what the patient, the patient would express what they were feeling, but that was about it, you know, their symptoms or something, but not their preferences or what's important to them in their lives and what they have to get back to in terms of work and what their fears were um, and what their support structure was like and all these things. There was none of that, right? And 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 then I, I thought I was doing a good job of explaining everything to patients, but what I realized was that really while I wasn't paternalistic, I was I was more informational, so mm -hmm. I, I I think I was doing a a good job of explaining many options and risks, and all the options actually, and the risks. And we're very blessed at PRMA because we're able to have those conversations because we do offer all the options, right? So, um, but then I realized that yes, I was giving all the info. But I was still following up with a recommendation, which was being offered to the patient before I had truly even tried to understand what was important to them. 
So, um, you know, you can have someone who's a perfect deep flat candidate, absolute perfect deep flat candidate, perfect lower abdominal tissue. Um, you know, they check all the boxes. Um, they're going to have a wonderful result. You're working with a top notch breast surgeon. It's going to be a home run. You're kind of you know, excited to be able to provide this outcome. But ultimately, if the patient wants implants, they're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. um, but to understand why a patient wants implants, what their goals are, their preferences, their values, um, that, you know, that, that's a crucial part of the exchange. And so the patient needs to educate the physician too in terms of what they're bringing to the table before you can make a shared decision and the best decision actually for the patient. So, you know, you can have twins, same body habitus, same diagnosis. And really, if you practice shared decision-making, you can end up with a completely different treatment plan for each of those from a surgery standpoint. Because what's important to one person may completely un be completely unimportant to another. Right. Um, so looking around, there wasn't anything that offered that um, in terms of an app or any technology. And so I put a team together and we made it. We got, we got some patients together. We got an advisory board together uh, for our patients. Uh, for the app that we had a specific patient advisory board. We had experts checking all the boxes for the different subspecialties. Um, so physician wise, you know, we had, you know, obviously plastic surgeons, multiple uh, breast surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, um, geneticists, um, rehab specialists. We had the, the full spectrum and for patients we had, Patients who, who had recovered from a breast cancer diagnosis. We had patients who had uh, gene mutations and were high risk uh, from a, f a family history. Also, we had patients divided up based on the choices they had made. So breast conservation, so lumpectomy, oncoplastic surgery. We had patients that chose to have aesthetic flat closure, or going flat. We had patients that had prophylactic surgery or risk reducing surgery patients who had had uh, surgery for invasive disease, DCIS, nipple sparing, skin sparing, immediate, delayed, implants, tissue expanders, tissue, different types of tissue. I mean, it was a massive uh, undertaking. And, and honestly, <laughs> it was one of the biggest personal growth experiences of my life because before I did that, I actually thought, I was a good physician, but that highlighted so many <laughs> areas in which I I had an inflated opinion of how well I was doing. I think it, it just made me better. That just that process made me better. It was really very interesting. It was humbling and exciting at the same time because it was like, well, you know, crap. If I thought I was doing such a good job and I had so many holes, <laughs> then maybe this app can really do some damage, right? So, um, yeah, the process has been really a lot of fun. And, it, you know, it, it's, it's out there. It's doing well. People are downloading it. People are telling us they're finding it useful. And we've got industry sponsoring it so we can keep it going. It's always going to be free to the patient. That's super important. That's, a, that's, a, that's not up for discussion. Uh, not that's non-negotiable as I tell my kids. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. You have a, the, a, you have a growth mindset as I used to tell my <laughs> kids. And in the years that I was teaching, uh, there were times where I changed the way that I interacted with my students and it really helped with my teaching craft just because, and I just became a better teacher because of it and including them in on decisions and making it more student centered so that I could find out more about them. And that just mm -hmm. changed the way I was, I taught. So I think that's really neat. I, I don't know how much time you have. I know we have allotted 30 minutes, 
but um, I do have a few more questions, but I also wanted to ask you in this app, um, there is a review and I'm wondering if I can read it to my audience. Sure. So this, this was really cool and it was a, a little while back, but, um, but I thought it was really neat because it's from a, an oncology and she's, she's an oncology nurse navigator. I don't know if you've read it yet. Um, but it's pretty cool. She gave you five, five stars <laughs> Cool. and it says what? as, as an oncology na nurse navigator specializing in breast cancer. I can attest to the importance of shared decision-making. Many patients are either unaware or not informed of all treatment and surgical options. This can create the feeling of being overwhelmed and having unnecessary pressure to make a decision without knowing the facts. That being said, this, uh, this proves there was a definite need to organize all the resources and information, and that's what the Breast Advocate app does. The Breast Advocate app is a wonderful tool for patients, navigators, and treating physicians. Treatment options are personalized and reviewed through a quick and easy questionnaire. Patients are also able to connect with others, others at various stages of treatment and survivorship, creating a virtual support group at, the, at your fingertips. The resources available are informative, concise, and fact-based. I've referred several patients to the app and have used the app myself to obtain information about unique patient diagnosis. I highly recommend all breast cancer patients, navigators, treating physicians to download this and use this app. Awesome. That is a great idea. I know. I, and I, that is a kind of, uh, that's exactly what, I, well, very similar to what I would have said, just because even though I wasn't able to use it for my own decision making, knowing it's there for other people, because I, because of my experience, I've become quite the advocate and I'm on a mission to get the information out to people that they need to know because it is so overwhelming. And I did go through the app pretty thoroughly and there's so much research out there. And I also went into the comment section, uh, the discussion sections, cause there's all kinds of different topics. And mm -hmm. I have read your responses to people who ask questions. You are a very personable, knowledgeable and clearly caring person from what oh, I have heard on the podcast and read. You can just tell that this is in your bones and it's just nice to know that there's someone out there like that. And I do believe that once we, I, I, I do believe that once we get uh, more options here in our own town, that, that that's going to make such a huge difference. Um, oh. Really appreciate all that. That's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Again, I don't know how much time you have. I know you're very busy. Do you have a little bit more time? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'm going to go into, and I'm going to put this app, it's all, it's going to be in the show notes. So anyone who is listening to my audience, you've got to click on this and you've got to download it. It is free. It is full of information. And if you do have questions, Dr. C will, will answer you back. <laughs> I'll try. Um, I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are yeah. other people on there too, that uh, it appears. And I also ran across somebody on your Instagram. You have an Instagram uh, page for the app and mm -hmm. to yourself personally and professionally. There is a yoga person who posted today who is partnering and being part of the app or something like that. And they did share yeah, it on have, Instagram too. Oh, awesome. Yeah. We, so yeah, we have a bunch of um, uh, patient advocacy partners. So those are non-financial arrangements. We, we have financial, we, we receive financial backing from industry sponsors. Okay. Um, that's how we keep, that's how we monetize the app and keep it going. Mm -hmm. But we also have patient advocacy partners and that's a non-financial arrangement and that's really just a way for us to um, collaborate with other patient advocacy networks that have the same patient facing and patient empowerment agendas right so you know it's just really trying to uh, rather than working at cross purposes you know, we're going to do a lot better if we all band together. Um, and so 
being able to support other organizations that are doing you know great stuff with the same with the same pro patient agenda right uh empowerment full information um really amplifying the patient's voice i mean look how powerful that can be i mean it just basically got cms to to you know go back on their plan to sunset the s code like you mentioned at the beginning um so the patient voice is so powerful and that is how change happens so we partner with anyone that is willing to exchange you know links and to help build a traffic network so we're all kind of in bed together as it were and we're all helping each other and so that's what patient the, the patient advocacy partnership is and probably what you saw today was was one of those advocacy groups who's mm -hmm. partnered with breast advocate um so yeah the website's breastadvocateapp.com and then mo we're on most social media channels if you just you know search for breast advocate we should come up um so the the yoga person i, I think that was a, a recent uh collaboration that we've started so that's that's, that's what good it news. That's yeah, awesome. that's what it appears. She she posted today a live video. Um and, and this app has been around since what 2018, is that what I saw? Yeah, launched in 18. Um and we're we're currently trying to actually we're trying to save our pennies right now for for the next version. We're trying to develop the next version, which is going to be incorporating AI and uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really cool. What we've got planned is really cool. We just need the funding for it. So we're trying okay. to trying to we're trying to funnel our um, industry sponsorship from away from. Um, we used to be we used to spend that money on things like Google Ads, um, but now, and, and and a lot of it is thanks to our patient advocate groups that we've partnered with. That that has helped us, you know, kind of gain some traction. It's kind of guerrilla marketing, as it were. So now we can save money on the downloads. We're not paying for downloads anymore because everything's organic. And so now we can funnel that money, which was quite a lot, actually. Now we can funnel that money into development, which is even more expensive than Google Ads. So uh, <clears throat> hopefully the incorporating ai will will make it even better you know especially with the wizard mm -hmm. i don't know if you saw the wizard that i did makes recommendations that's a shared decision making wizard that's a lot of complex computing on the back end that we want to add ai to um so uh, and then we also want to add a kind of a patient navigator of sorts that's going to be ai based so well and that's just a couple of the things i, I would love to do but it's all it's just money, you know. Yeah, just, <laughs> so we, just yeah. a small thing. <laughs> so that, that's where industry sponsors come in. So, um, yeah, uh, very exciting times. Um, yeah, very exciting I, times. I love how you talk about the importance of patient advocacy and patient am patients amplifying their voices and making things happen. I have definitely improved on that this whole year just because of my situation. And sometimes I feel like a real ass when I do that <laughs> to certain people. Like I, I felt really bad in, um, canceling my surgery here in Reno, but I had to, because I know that when you get breast surgery, if you're going to have a mastectomy, you want to do immediate reconstruction. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, the best absolutely. way to do it. And that's what I needed to do. And I, for a little while, really felt like a jerk. And I felt like I was doing something wrong or something. But in my, in my heart, I felt that way. In my mind, I knew I was doing the right thing. So speaking up for myself was really the best thing I could have done. And I'm hoping that there is no hard feelings. I just think that knowledge is power. And for all of us, physicians, surgeons, patients, caregivers, because when I first decided to go to New Orleans, my husband had a fit. I had, it took about <laughs> two or three days 
before my husband finally looked at the literature and did the research on his own. And he will tell you straight up that it was the best decision we could have made. But he was that he is the type of person to say, no, you have a team here. You need to listen to them. The physician knows what they're, you know, the nurse, surgeon knows what they're doing, which they do. But I had other plans. And then I had to make, I had to amplify my voice to him to tell him, this is my body. I'm not going to a back alley, back alley butcher to get my breast chopped off. This is something that's very personal to me. And this is what I feel is best for my body. So I really greatly appreciate that you also feel that, that we all need to work on this together and you need, as the surgeon need to get to know the patient and what their wants, their desires, you know, all of their feelings about what they, is best for their body. For sure. And, and some of the reasons, though, I mean, um, not that this drives the decision to practice this way, because it's, it's, it's work, right, to this is all extra, right? And so once you once once you incorporate this into your practice, then yes, it's seamless and it's it's a it's a pathway and it becomes uh, very very efficient. But you know, whenever you step outside of a routine and try and grow, you know, you mentioned the growth mindset, but that's change and change is hard. So um, it's easier to do when it's one person. It's harder to do when it's an entire practice of you know a, a team of forty people. Yeah. Um, but what I want physicians to know is that in some ways, you know, they, they, well, not in some ways, in many ways, they benefit from this too. They benefit from shared decision-making because a patient who is involved in their decisions, uh, and in the treatment planning and who does have a voice that is heard, that patient is number one, fully educated. That means they are more likely to be fully compliant. Uh, they are also fully bought in. So, you know, when things go well, you know, where the, the surgeon's a genius, right? Oh, I have the best surgeon in the world. I had a great outcome. It's when things don't go according to plan, that's when the rubber meets the road. And so if you don't have patient buy-in full buy-in over the planning, the treatment planning, the decision making, you know, and they don't even know why certain things were done, not really, right? They don't truly understand, then that only hurts you on the back end. So not practicing shared decision making, I think, is a lost opportunity, actually, for for many physicians. I think their practices would benefit if they incorporated that approach regardless of the specialty you know there are multiple studies out there that have looked at this and they've tied improved outcomes improved clinical outcomes and improved patient satisfaction directly to shared decision making it's actually a central pillar for uh, obamacare so um like i said it's not an old i mean it's not a new concept it's very much an older kind of tried and tested very mature concept and it works um so to practicing this way because patients feel better and they mm -hmm. feel included and they feel educated and they feel very appreciative so it's intrinsically rewarding but at the same time um it, it it's it also improves your practice so you don't even have to do it because you're being a good guy right <laughs> Just, yeah, there, there, are, there are lots of reasons all the way around, right? So many, many benefits to practicing this way. Well, that is the experience I had in New Orleans I, at the Center for Restorative Breast Surgery. I had Dr. Cabling and we had some decisions to make together the day before my surgery. And he was very, very compassionate and actually even put his phone number in my phone so that I could text him or call him if I had any questions 
or if I had changed my mind about some decisions that we all made mm-hmm. together, my husband, Dr. Cabling, his um, nurse and I were making these decisions together. And so going into my surgery, I felt a whole heck of a lot better because of the way, way he treated me, the way he included me in on the decision and asked me a lot of questions. And I'm even still on texting basis with him now because I've had to ask him questions uh, for my second surgery. I have a revision coming up soon and he's just very, very, he communicates well, he gets back to me right away. He's probably, he's going to be on my podcast at some point. So um, anyway, so yeah, I'm, I totally agree with that. I have just a couple more questions. I wanted to know what your advice, what advice you, do you have for those who have just been diagnosed with breast cancer or a high risk gene mutation? Uh, I would say you have more time than you think you do to research your options and be as comfortable as possible with your treatment. So, you know, for for <clears throat> A new cancer diagnosis, you know, that cancer didn't develop yesterday. It's been there for a little bit and taking a couple of weeks to try and get to grips with your options is not going to make any difference, really. And and that doesn't mean putting everything on hold either. There are plenty of things that can be moving along. So ultimately, you don't delay any of your treatment, right? in terms of insurance and that kind of stuff. There's plenty of things you can do. Uh, I'm I'm not saying to freeze everything, you know, for for weeks or months on end. That's absolutely not what I'm saying, but it is important to take a little bit of time. You know, you can't have surgery yesterday. And um, whether you have the surgery tomorrow or in a couple of weeks or in three weeks or in a month, it's it's not going to make a difference. Okay. So, you know, don't delay things six months, but don't don't let the anyone in your medical team make you feel like this is an emergency and you don't have time to ask questions and you don't have time to do a little bit of research. So I think that's a really, really important point. Um I had the, a the, really I, I had a really small window of time. Um between the time that I stopped chemo and December, I had well, to. Well, right, but 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 that's what I mean. You were going through chemo, so you know you could have been researching surgical options while you were undergoing chemo, for example. Mm-hmm. Right, you don't have to wait until you're done with your chemo um, to start researching the next step. And, and and I think that's actually part of the problem is that the way medicine is practice everything everything is stepwise so you it's a kind of a need to know basis so lo- lots of women go through their treatment and then you know only to find out that oh now you'll need radiation and it's like well, what do you mean now i need radiation <laughs> why are you just telling me about this now well you didn't need to know before it's like well actually i i would have it would have been good to know back then and here's why right i mean and from our standpoint radiation and reconstruction that's a very important you know factor to consider because it can impact the best you know what the best surgical option is and the timing and lots of things but you know really had you known that you should or could research you had i mean while you were sitting there getting your neoadjuvant chemotherapy would have been <laughs> ideal time to research your options and find New Orleans or PRMA or wherever. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so, and, and, but you also need to know that you can do that, right? Which isn't when you're, when, when you've got so many things weighing on you and so many things going through your mind and you're still trying to get to grips with the fact that you're, that you have to sit in that chair to have this chemo it's easy for me to say oh well you could have been researching your options and and now for you in retrospect you're going to look back and say well crap had i known back then well yeah yeah i guess that would have been an ideal time but just remember how you were feeling at mm-hmm. that moment 
Yes, I remember is, very is well. Go- and- <laughs> yeah, is this chemo going to work? Where, am I going to be here in a year? Am I, you know, all these things. Um, so it's easier said than done. I get it. But, you know. So I think that's why I like that's why I like the app is because you can go into that wizard and you can choose. I just was diagnosed with breast cancer and take Mm -hmm. it from there. And then you can go back through the wizard and change your answers accordingly. So with that being said, I was told by a little birdie about deep flap back in the summertime, right after I was diagnosed Mm -hmm. and my mind was not even there. I -hmm. was like, super overwhelmed with everything else, doctor's appointments, scans, blood tests, all the things, right? And mm-hmm. and, and the, the prospect of losing my hair and la la la. And so, but had I known about this app, which is why I wanted you on the show, because I want my, I want people to be able to know about this earlier on, and then they can go through it and answer the questions and look at the comments and look at the research as they're going through the chemo or whatever treatment they are being put through and then kind of make their decision. So I I Mm -hmm. feel like because I went back, I I did it backwards. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I want to be able to get people to do it the other way. All right. So what advice do you have for those patients who have breast uh, reconstruction that they are not happy with, perhaps because they have implants that they are not, that's not agreeing with them mentally or physical, physically. I I think, uh, yeah, I, th- I think this is a nice question to kind of bring everything together. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, like like we've said, there are other options, right? Um, there are plenty of women who are very happy with implants and there are plenty mm-hmm. of women who are not. Uh, if you've had implants, chances are, not, not always, uh, but most of the time there are other options in terms of tissue that you can use from the patient's body, you know, somewhere else that, uh, we can transfer and exchange the implants for tissue. So replace the implants with the patient's own tissue. Uh, even if someone's had a tummy tuck and, you know, if they've had a full tummy tuck before and, and they don't have the tissue for a deep flap, there are other tissue options. Um, I, I think it's Im- important to also know that uh, or really emphasize that not everyone not all surgeons offer all procedures. And so it's okay to get a second opinion if someone says you're not a candidate for something. So second opinions are very helpful. I'm very quick to suggest to my patients to get one. Um, I think anyone who tries to dissuade a second opinion, I think you should not just seek a second opinion. I think you should run from that physician because second opinions are extremely valuable. They rarely hurt, even if it's to reinforce that the first opinion and the first recommendation was the right thing to do. Well, you know, probably the right, you know, the best thing to do. Uh, so don't shy away from second opinions. Um, and, and remember that not, not everyone offers everything, especially in a fee-for-service system. So this conversation is a little bit different. If you're in the UK, in, you know, for example, in the National Health Service, where the surgeon gets paid the same irrespective of the procedure they offer, mm-hmm. versus in the US where they may have um, financial incentives, you know, it's kind of the elephant in the room, right? It's the big gorilla in the corner. Yes. Uh, but But... You know, the financial aspect of it matters because, as we've seen with the S code and deep flap surgery, if you don't at least get reimbursed fairly and it's not financially viable to offer a procedure, then the surgeon is less likely to gain the experience to be able to offer it. And then down the line, that patient not having had the experience and not being able to offer certain procedures, they're only going to offer what they're comfortable with, and we're back to implants again. So, you know, it's not PC to talk about these things, or you know, necessarily, but it's the reality of healthcare economics, and it's very, very important, right? And well, so, <laughs> you know, I, I, in a, in a, 
what you want in society is you want affordable access for everyone through insurance, right? That's really, everyone should have that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, not everyone is trained in these procedures. Not everyone has the experience. So you, you may well be a very good candidate for a procedure that your surgeon isn't equipped to offer you. So, and then it's human nature. I, I, you know, I don't want people to think, oh, I went and saw this, saw this surgeon and they didn't know how to do it. Therefore, they dissuaded me. It's not, I'm, I'm not, here's what I'm saying. I, even if someone feels they can do a procedure, if they don't do it all the time, human nature dictates that they'll find a reason to offer you something else that they're more comfortable in. So we see people from all over the place who have seen other microsurgeons and they're told they're not a candidate for surgery. And then they, they see us and we're like, I don't know why this lady was told that because, you know, having a couple of C-sections is not a contraindication to deep flap surgery. Mm -hmm. Having an umbilical hernia repair in the past is not a contraindication to deep flap surgery. You know, she's got plenty of tissue for what she's looking for. She wants B-cup breasts. She's got plenty of tissue for B-cup breasts. So she's, no, she's not too skinny. You know, so there all these reasons that people are quoted, and you know, they're told, you know, as to why they're not candidates for something. And if you see someone that does a lot of that procedure, then, you know, the recommendation may well be different. So... Mm -hmm. Um, don't shy away from a second opinion. Okay. Well, number one, thank you for talking about things that are not quote PC <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> because I really think that that is incredibly important for patients to have in their mind of why they're getting responses, the kinds of responses they're getting. And thank you for also bringing in getting a second and maybe even a third opinion because answers are different. And I have experienced that myself in the last year. And so I'm very much, and, and it's not about not trusting your doctor or your surgeon or whatever. I mean, you yourself, you tell people, get a second opinion, mm -hmm. see what somebody else has to say, and then you can make your own decision of, of what you want to go with. So um, just the mere fact that you tell your patients that, or at least suggest it, it tells me that you are more caring about the patient and the outcome and what's best for them. So thank you for that. I want to wrap this up by letting my audience know that I've got some really great resources and uh, ways to contact you. Is it okay? I have your email address in there and I also have your Instagram mm -hmm. uh, link on there. Resources. I have your link tree in there. I, I, I've been yeah. stalking you. That's great. That's great. <laughs> no, the, link link. <laughs> the link tree is great. Um, yeah. My, my link tree, Breast Advocates link tree. Um, they're, they're both. Oh, okay. I'll put that in there too. I have Dr. C's link place. tree. So I'll grab the breast, uh, the breast advocate app link tree. Oh, I did put it in there. Or did you put it in there? I think, I don't know if you did or I did. I can't remember, but I, I have all my notes here, but I also have the breast advocate website and the, also the breast advocate on Instagram. Is there anything else I should add to that? Uh, no, I think, okay. I think with the link tree, everything is there. Perfect. So we've got, Perfect. we've got a really good, uh, YouTube channel, the breast advocate YouTube channel, but that's on the, I think on that's the on link, the link tree. tree. Yeah. And, link and, tree and, is and, so and, cool. <laughs> oh, it's so, it's so convenient. So convenient. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have one myself. I don't have as many things on, on mine as yours, but it, I will. Anyway, well, I just thoroughly appreciate your taking the time. I know you are very busy, but clearly very interested in getting information, really important information out there to patients and caregivers and other uh, providers. So thank you for being on my podcast. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? No, I, I just... I want to thank you again for the invitation and to thank you for your efforts um, advocating for patients and what you're doing. And uh, it's, a, it's a big deal 
it's a really big deal. Um, and I know that women who are following in your footsteps are really, really going to appreciate it. And unfortunately, the number of women who are following in your footsteps is only going up on a yearly basis. So, so thank you for, for what you're doing. Hey, well, thank you for saying so, because I feel like I have a purpose and a mission and an interest, and I want to help as many people as I possibly can. So thank you again, and I hope the rest of your day is amazing. And to my audience, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Test Those Breasts, and we will see you next time on the next episode.